program to um, Kurt and Buddy with the Progressive awesome. Group. And All right. Good morning. Um, thanks for the uh, the invitation to present. My name is Kurt Kaliga. I'm the CEO of, of the Progressive Group. And then Buddy Whitman uh, is our, uh, Dr. Whitman is our Vice President of Scientific Affairs on the line as well. Okay. Um, so what we're going to come at it uh, just, um, from, we're a little different direction here because um, we're going to try to just give a kind of a general and kind of high level education about cannabis uh, use really from a, a lab testing perspective and like a medical um, provider treatment center perspective and just share some trends that we're seeing as a as a local uh, resource. Um, <clears throat> the lab, the progress progressive diagnostics itself is a clinical laboratory. Um, we primarily have traditionally focused on pain management, mental health, you know, primary care markets. And <clears throat> um, so we have a lot, we have a ton of experience with, with drug testing. And that's really what we're best at. And we're contracted with pretty much all the major, major players um, to try to make sure the, uh, the cost of uh, treatment is affordable. Um, so there's, there are a handful of uh, players that we're not contracted with that we're working on. Um, <clears throat> the thing that we do too is we take all the data and really try to um, integrate it into all the treatment plans. So we'll give you an idea of what a treatment plan really should look like um, with, with, with drug testing. And the other arm of the company is the Progressive Institute. So the lab's in Trumbull and the Institute is in Shelton. And that's an outpatient um, addiction and psychiatric treatment facility. Um, again, contract with all, all the major players to make sure this is affordable. But um, we that's where we come at it from a, an actual provider standpoint. So um, while we understand the drug testing itself, we are... Um, we're treating people further down the line than, than employment, um, like the pre-screens or something like that. Um, once someone has a bit of an issue, um, that's typically where we come in. Uh, we don't do employment testing. Um, well, again, like we do medical management and we handle, we typically handle the addiction or dependency on, on a drug. So in this case, it's, it's a THC, but, um, uh, all these type of drugs are highly addictive and uh, just quitting something is quite a challenge. Um, that's where medical management comes into place. And, um, and that's why we want to get a little bit into drug testing here. So it's not as if you test somebody and they're positive for THC. Um, and then the next time they're negative and you're good, uh, that might be the case. But depending on the patient's profile, it might be a longer period. It might be a longer timeline. And the last thing I'll just quickly say before I turn it over to Buddy and I'll jump back in is um, the presenter before made a really good point about some people wanting to remove uh, THC from their panel, uh, from their drug testing panel. We're seeing that too. Like a lot of providers will say, you know what, I'm not going to test for marijuana. Let me say this. They were saying that because it's becoming legalized. Um, but the only problem with that that we have learned is that um, while it might be legal, uh, alcohol is also legal and they're both really powerful drugs. So just because it's legal doesn't mean it can't perform a person's uh, you know, personal and professional performance. Um, and we are seeing <clears throat> actually <clears throat> mar <clears throat> excuse me, marijuana induced psychosis. So the first time we saw that was three years ago. Um, where a chronic smoker, teenage uh, individual uh, developed psychosis from so much um, marijuana smoking. It's become more common in the last, I'd say, 12 months. It's actually become more common. Uh, four or five years ago, we never saw it. Um, so, it, you know, it's a trend. All right, so I'll flip it over to Buddy. So we want, first wanted to start out um, just kind of outlining what toxicology testing is and, and how it is utilized and, and what it actually means. So um, in these tests, we get uh, quantitative values back. And I think the most important aspect of, of um, the toxicology testing is that it's, um, um, although we're getting a, a definitive quantitative value for it, um, these values don't mean much in, in terms of uh, when the drug was last taken, how much of the drug was taken, um, and uh, even the source of the drug sometimes. 
Um, so, so there are limitations to what we can uh, do with this in information, even though it is uh, a quantitative test. Um, and these tests, uh, the quantitative value typically decreases over time and depending on what the drug is and the clearance rate, uh, the metabolism of the individual, um, all of those factors sort of um, contribute to uh, how long that drug is detectable in the system. So something like THC, uh, chronic smokers will test positive uh, up to four to six weeks um, after uh, their last use. Um, and the only really way, real way to know if that, that use continues uh, would be to look at a baseline versus uh, a current test to see if there's spikes in, in that. Um, but again, you can't tell how long ago um, the, the person was using based on these tests, which are, um, could contribute to um, some, some confusion with uh, on-duty use versus after-hour recreational use. Moving on to the next slide, testing. So toxicology testing in, in general um, is used to determine, determine if an individual has been exposed either to um, a legal drug, uh, often prescription medication uh, in a medical management uh, situation such as pain management. So these um, uh, providers often order um, tests to ensure uh, compliance with the, the medications that they're being provided were also um, used in, in uh, determining if Ill illegal drugs are used. So just some uh, types of testing, uh, there's point of care screening, so little cups that determine if there is presence or absence of a particular substance. These are sort of the least accurate ways of, of looking at um, uh, these, these tests. Um, then there's uh, laboratory uh, preliminary screening, which is immunoassay and it's qualitative, so presence, absence of, of a specific drug. Um, they're relatively um, sensitive for detection of presence absence of the drug, but really can't tell uh, much more about it. And then there's more uh, high complexity confirmation testing using uh, liquid chromatography, uh, dual phantom mass spec. Um, and this is quantitative and it's very, very sensitive and very specific. Um, but again, the, the catch you get into is even with that, um, you can't tell exactly what dose the person has taken. Um, the timing of that unnecessarily. Um, and then each specific drug has its own clearance rate. So something like uh, I just mentioned with THC, you're looking at you know four to six weeks clearance rate, whereas some other drugs um, will clear within uh, a day or two. So just some of the uh, trends that we're seeing in, in research, this is uh, uh, NIH and NIDA. Uh, uh, research affecting cannabis, uh, we see a, kind of an increase in um, in long-term research projects surrounding uh, cannabis currently. And part of that is driven by um, a, a good lack of knowledge, but also um, the legalization of recreational marijuana in uh, across um, the country. So the first one, um, these are these are links, so we can get you the links if anybody's interested in reading more. But uh, hearing on uh, cannabis policies uh, for the new decade. This is a, a study, uh, a congressional testimony um, looking at the adverse effects of cannabis, uh, current NIH efforts of research, and then the risk and benefits of, of cannabis use as a potential therapeutic. Um, so even, even the medical use of marijuana is still um, under a great deal of research. And another area that's um, um, quite prominently being researched currently is marijuana use and pregnancy and lactation. So the effects of, of uh, cannabis use on um, pregnant mothers and um, unborn children. And then preventing use uh, with a focus on, on women in pregnancy. Um, and then finally, some areas that are um, really being studied now is this psychotic symptoms uh, in some marijuana users and the challenges it poses for uh, providers being though as though they, they mask or uh, mimic other psychotic uh, uh, episodes. And we're seeing a lot more of that um, in real life, which is kind of confirmation that, that um, this research is, is heading um, down at least the right, right path. Okay, you wanna come to the next one? So just looking at uh, trends, again, this is a, a long-term study monitoring the future uh, study um, and it's uh, annually been tracking substance use among college students and non-college uh, age um, 
adults from uh, age 19 to 22 since um, back in 1980. And uh, the most current um, findings are that the highest level of, of marijuana use uh, recorded among college age adults in 2020 since the 1980s. So it's, it's, um, we see this trend of, of marijuana use going up um, considerably over the last few years. Uh, part of that is probably driven by um, access or ease of access. Um, and there's a significant increase in hallucinogenics um, and substantial and significant drop in uh, the current use of alcohol between uh, 2019 and, and 2020. And then um, we see a, a drop in prescription opioid misuse uh, continue to decline um, over uh, the last five years or so. All right, so I think Kurt's going to switch over and talk a little bit more about um, uh, drug testing and how it is used and integrated into um, uh, medical management. Yes. Um, okay, so, and, and here, again, we're kind of more on the clinical side of things, but when it comes to drug testing for us, um, the, the, the um, like, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine does a good job of, of uh, explaining that um, drug testing really needs to be used, like, in collaboration with a treatment plan. Um, so what we, the first bullet talks about drug testing um, is assisted with uh, a, a monitoring adherence to an abstinence program um, to, to improve outcomes. So that could be someone in addiction or pain management or psych psychiatry. Um, and what we're trying to do, again, is monitoring um, their drug use and adherence to a particular uh, protocol that's been developed for them to try to help them with their addiction. Um, you know, the second bullet talks about drug testing is, is really the, you know, what they call the technology of addiction treatment. Um, but it's not just, you know, it's not just taking an x-ray of somebody it's, um, and seeing they have a broken leg. It's like, well, you take the x-ray, they have a broken leg. Now, now how do you treat that patient? So the same thing on a dr drug test, if they're positive, um, that's all well and good, but that's just the diagnostic component. And then how is that diagnostic component utilized to help that person uh, get better? So the, they, they do emphasize having, um, in the third bullet, a provider or a doctor um, um, should have like, a working relationship with a lab, but a lab that actually has an expertise in drug testing um, and in addiction uh, medicine, uh, because there, there are a lot of nuances to uh, like Buddy was saying, some things um, a patient may present with psychosis, um, but it might be marijuana-induced psychosis. So understanding that on a laboratory standpoint helps that clinician um, come up with a more appropriate treatment protocol for that person. And that's why they also really emphasize having a collaborative relationship um, so that there is uh, a lot of flexibility in how that provider can, can treat that patient and also interpret the results. Um, often the, the scientists, you know, they really understand the test, but the doctors really understand the treatment. So collaborating is, is really important if you have someone who ultimately needs to go to treatment, okay? And then the next slide um, really dives into just a little bit more. Um, this is a three-dimensional process here. So in that, um, in that first uh, category, uh, there are three little, three little cubes here, but on that behavioral assessment, like really one of the first things that needs to be done is understand that patient and what is their physical state, um, what's their psychological state, and what's their risk for addiction. addiction. So, you know, doctors will tell you if, they, if someone comes in and, uh, hey, if they're a high-performing um, executive with, uh, um, uh, you know, really motivated for work and, you um, psychologically, they've got a really stable family and everything's good, um, and their risk of addiction is relatively low, well, their test profile, like what types of drugs you might um, be testing for on that next um, square there, might just be THC. Maybe it's THC and alcohol, maybe it's recreational drugs. Um, and the frequency might be infrequent, right? You might need to test them monthly or quarterly or something like that, annually. But if you go back and you have another employee who comes in 
um, physically, you know, disheveled, really not motivated. Um, their psychological state is, 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 uh, you know, one of dependency. And then you, and then once you dig into their risk of addiction, you find out maybe they had some trauma in their life and you uncover and unpack the reasons for their use is it really just to cope, but it's really to hide things from the past, that type of thing. That drug profile, that test profile might be different. So you actually might, in an extreme, you know, extreme case like that, maybe you're adding cocaine and methamphetamine on that profile and the testing frequency, you know, depends on, on the person. It could be weekly. It, it just all depends. And the bottom, the net result there is you just have to have an individualized and dynamic medical monitoring protocol. And that protocol needs to change with how that patient progresses over time. So it's not just, hey, negative or positive on a test. It's how is this information being used for this person at this point in time? And then how how's it used over time? But again, that's what we do. And we're a little, a little further down the line. Hopefully none of you need to be learning this much about drug testing. Um, and then the next slide, two more slides. Um, just interesting things. Uh, we pulled this data from um, uh, a subset of data here in Connecticut over, over a few month period of time. And what we see here, you, know, you see uh, dangerous uh, drug combinations. Um, so you see alcohol and a benzodiazepine. Benzos are very, very common. I think uh, Fairfield County is the, uh, I think I forget now, it might be the number one county in um, Connecticut for benzodiazepines. Um, benzos alone are fine, but benzos and alcohol can be deadly. And that's happening about 3% of the time in this, in this um, subset of data. And then we're seeing um, alcohol and opioids being mixed uh, up, sometimes up to 10, 10 11% of the time. Um, this is very, very uh, concerning. And then um, everybody hears about fentanyl and usually it's fentanyl and, and heroin. So only, it's only one and a half percent right now, but, but we're starting to see fentanyl, uh, cocaine laced fentanyl. So someone might come in saying, yeah, I'm addicted to cocaine or use cocaine, but they're behaving differently than your typical cocaine um, addicted person. And that might be because they're actually doing fentanyl. And then the last slide, I think it's the last slide, would be um, just uh, alcohol is the most common thing we see. So you see ETG and ETS, those are, that's alcohol. Um, these are positive uh, drugs of concern. Um, some are illicit, some aren't. Um, we're seeing uh, THC growing. So uh, uh, it's a typo there, but THC is, is gaining in popularity um, and it supports the slides that Buddy showed on a national level that THC is increasing and alcohol is actually coming down for the younger population. And then we're seeing um, um, uh, the six ma'am is heroin and the fentanyl. So we're, we're continuing to see that. And the benzos that we just talked about um, are definitely rising uh, as a combination type of drug. Um, most, you know, a benzo is, is a prescription. And I think that's it. So yeah, that was just our perspective from a, a provider side. Great. Thank you so much, um, Kurt and Buddy. I'm going to allow open questions again while we make the changeover in the slides. I have a question. Um, you had spoken about the psychotic or psychosis, marijuana-induced psychosis, and the studies with that. Just curious, is, that, is there a clear link that it's marijuana or cannabis-induced? yet established or are those people more prone to psychosis anyway? And I'm saying that from a completely uneducated, um, from a provider standpoint question. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a really great question. And um, that goes to the complexity of all this. Um, it really requires, it's individualized. So it really requires a, a really deep dive on each individual uh, person. So we, you know, there are uh, teens who um, are smoking a lot and they're thinking, you know, these are, this is what we hear. Um, they feel like it's legal and they're just smoking a ton and um, they do have some underlying issues for sure. That's why their, their usage is so high, but the, yeah. um, the frequency of it 
And then the dosing is um, a challenge. And then sometimes they don't actually know if they're smoking. So they think they're smoking one thing, but it's actually yeah. got something else in it. Okay. Yeah.